Um, so I'm going to drink a coffee if that's okay, and then um, take you through some basic funding terms. Um, it's meant to give you a very much a high level view. So um, just jump in with um, any questions you have. I want this to be interactive, so it's, it's for you guys. So any questions you have is really what we should look at. Roughly, that's the agenda I had in mind. Um, try and run through this as quickly as we can without boring you all. Um, I appreciate you may be in different stages as well as businesses um, in terms of funding uh, and also in terms of obviously experience. You know, what you guys have done before, you may have interacted with this, um, with, with uh, investors in the past, some of you more so than others. So essentially, we'll run through this. Um, term sheets, you know, very important sometimes, sometimes not so important. Uh, but they typically uh, need to be dealt with in some way, shape, or form. So you need to understand what that, uh, what term sheets are about. Um, the funding itself, the types of funding that you can see. Um, value protection, control issues, those are things then we get into the nitty gritty, if you like. Uh, the types of provisions that investors will look for, um, they'll talk to you about. And um, trying to give you the background to why sometimes these things are important for them, okay? Um, and really, the, the whole point of this is to make sure that you appreciate, not surprised by, uh, not shocked by, uh, or, you know, uh, or just you know, ready, to, ready to sort of compromise or, or look at it in a different light if need be. But always, obviously, it's got to be right for you guys as a team. Yeah. So term sheets, um, I said interactive. So can anyone feel free to jump in and tell me why people bother with term sheets? They're not legally binding, typically. So why do we have term sheets? Absolutely. <clears throat> on the same page, so it's really about high levels. Yeah, this is not the legal contract that you will be going to court on one day if things go really badly. Um, but it can accelerate uh, the legal imp implementation side of things, yeah? And it certainly makes sure that before people start incurring costs, uh, hiring lawyers, etc., doing due diligence, um, this is at least in place. And sometimes the high level due diligence may be done in tandem with this, right? So what kind of things you should be looking at and, and thinking about when you see term sheets? Um, Pre-money valuation. Everybody, I think, in this room probably knows what a pre-money valuation is, but absolutely critical, obviously, because this goes to the heart of um, how much money you take and how much dilution you will suffer, right? So before the investor's money have come in, what's a number that, that you and the investors together agree is a, is a right number, uh, given the, you know, the, the facts you have at the time, uh, that should be uh, attached to your business, okay? So valuation, absolutely critical. People talk about post-money valuation too. That's once the money's come in, what does a cap table look like, yeah? Um, <clears throat> the thing to just note about that is whether it's phrased as fully diluted or not. Um, you guys know what fully diluted actually means? No? Um, so fully diluted is a phrase used to represent the impact things like options that may be in play, which haven't yet been exercised, haven't been converted into shares. So things that are convertible into shares could result in shares, which haven't yet been converted or has, hasn't given rise to shares. So when you say the fully diluted issued share capital, that means if you had shares of 90, say, and there was another 10 options out there, the fully diluted share capital table would, would be 100 shares in issue, okay, at that point, not 90. And so it takes into account the dilution effect that those options out there may have, yeah? Um, business plan, um, really important in terms of making sure that, um, you know, people are, people are completely comfortable about uh, what post-money implementation strategy and expectations for the business look like. Um, good investors will invariably want you to produce something called a business plan. They come in all shapes and sizes. Um, and different lengths, different documents, Excel spreadsheets. Um, they're really ultimately about getting to grips with the numbers that you need to get to grips with essentially as a business, for your business, right? So, um, <clears throat> you know, you're gonna do some hires with the money that you raise. So use of proceeds is really important. So you need to be very clear on what it is that you're raising money for, right? And the business plan should map that your expectations uh, founded on reasonable grounds because you will be asked to give warranties by investors typically about those doc that document. So you need to make sure when you project things for the future that you're not doing this you know, with too much optimism 
Um, don't destroy the optimism, but, but I think it's got to be reasonable, right? Because you have to warrant that the business plan you put together has been put together, um, you know, honestly, diligently, and on basis of reasonable assumptions. You can make assumptions, you need to make assumptions, otherwise you can't forecast, but those assumptions have to be reasonable, yeah? <clears throat> so don't think, if I do some amazing assumptions, I can get some amazing numbers on this business plan, and therefore my valuation arguments with the investors will be much easier, I get a higher number. That's the wrong way to look at it, clearly, right? <clears throat> Stop me if I'm teaching granny to suck eggs here. If you know this stuff, we'll, we'll skip over fast. Um, management team incentives, again, you know, this is um, what founders uh, are all about. You guys are here because you guys, as a, as a group, you feel you click. It's really important you continue to have that good working relationship. Uh, good investors will look at that, will probe that, test that before they put their money to work in you because they want to make sure that that team is the right team. Um, I think it doesn't have to be the complete team on day one necessarily, maybe, um, provided you, you are aware of that and you make um, investors aware of that and you say that the first hire you're going to do with the money is somebody to back you up on this because you feel there's a gap there. Yeah. Um, I think the discourse with investors just have to be very sensible. And if they respect you because they see that you've, you've already grasped the areas of your business where you need to get further support, um, that really helps them validate um, you know, your, your sort of ability to execute, your ability to listen and, and, and take on board information and then grow a better thing out of that, right? So they're looking always for the team. Do they listen? Do they work well as a unit together? But then also, do they listen to someone like me um, even if you may fundamentally disagree on the suggestion that they're making, but you do you approach it in the right way, right? And it's through sensible arguments that you will knock away people's, uh, you know, suggestions, um, not through, you know, emotional outbursts. So they're looking for those basics. It's like human relationships, right? Um, employee share option pool, it's the incentivization element. Typically, at seed rounds, you won't have an options uh, pool in place. It costs money to set one up. You won't have a large team anyway to incentivize. But, but you will also say to investors at the time you do the first round seed documentation that you'll put away 10% maybe of the company to be made available to future hires. Yeah? And it's an agreement in principle in the documentation that, and the term sheet should reflect that, that a certain number of the issued share capital immediately post the completion of the seed round will be put aside into an option pool for future hires. It means that everybody will be diluted equally, yeah, including the investors. Sometimes you see things where the dilution is restricted to just the investors or just the founders or, you know, that, but these are, un, you know, I think they're uncommon, yeah. Um, conditions to completion of the investment, you know, they don't have to be, so when we as lawyers talk about, you know, is there a condition to completion, that's technical, comp, you know, parlance for, is there a gap between the date you sign the documents and the date you complete and receive the money? That's not what I mean here. This is more about um, at the stage of the companies that you guys are at, it's very unlikely unless you're some sort of a regulated business uh, that you will have a gap between a signing of a document and a, you know, an investment agreement, uh, which is the contractual promise to invest, and the date on which the money comes in and you issue the shares. Very unlikely. So here what we're talking about is the way in which investors will approach the due diligence element, for instance. So term sheets will typically say conditions of completion include the following. Satisfactory due diligence into your business. So commercials, speaking to you guys, all that stuff. Some investors are more heavy about that. Some are less. You know, it depends on the stage of your business. Some investors take a view on that if you're very early. Some may think the IP is critical and just look at the IP and send an IP person in to have a look at the, you know, the, the work you've done, how you've constructed it, etc. That's also relatively rare, I would say, at this stage. Um, the other conditions may be, you know, they may say service contracts have to be put in place for each of the founders at the time you complete the deal. Because most of you won't have a formal service agreement in place, but one of the things that you will at some point want to have in place yourselves as well is, um, is, a, is a proper service agreement. Um, so, and then the type of, uh, you know, investment, is it shares, is it convertible loan notes, we've got to get onto that. Economic rights that attach to the investment, is it standard ordinary shares, you have ordinary shares, investors have ordinary shares, they all rank equally, so it's just the numbers and percentages of the shares that you have that matter from an economic output point of view. That would be what the usual outcome would be here. Um, and then exclusivity and confidentiality, which are probably the two things that may be legally binding. Does anyone know what exclusivity is? 
No. Um, it's a phrase used to describe the scenario where the investor says, <clears throat> once you sign the term sheet with me, you're not allowed to go and negotiate with somebody else for another six weeks or so, right? Four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, whatever the period you, you agree is. But it's, it's giving them some protection that uh, they're about to commit to you to incur some fees, uh, perhaps, and uh, they want you locked down for that period. Again, not absolutely common, but you do see it even at this stage. Certainly in large M&A transactions we've done in the past, that, that's a definite yes, um, because people are worried about you know, all the work you do, you get near the end, a better deal gets put on the table, you know, suddenly you're lost, right? So, and then you know, break fees can be put in place and stuff to cover some of that, but, but it's the time and the hassle and everything else. Any questions on term sheets generally before we switch on to the next funding? Yep. Sorry. Yeah. So for, for protecting the investors, that's understood. Is there any way of protecting the investees by saying, you know, if you decide you don't want to do this investment, sort of let us know, because quite often investors can go away, they start doing due diligence, and then they lose interest, but you're still can be tied in with some sort of exclusivity uh, feeling of obligation towards them, and that can really damage your Yes, um, so the question is, can you do something for yourselves to, in the wording of the exclusivity provisions, to try and give you the ability to you know, switch horses, as it were, switch investor target midway? Um, you can draft something like that without any problems, I would think. Is it normal for me to see that? Not so much. Um, typically, the argument tends to center around um, you know, the period of exclusivity, because if you imagine you're looking for half a million, the guy's gonna give you half a million and they want exclusivity, you, in your head, the only thing you really care about is if you pre-agree the valuations, every, all the other terms are settled, then it's the base on which you're happy to do the deal. So really what you're more concerned about at that point typically is, um, you know, I don't want this to drag out too long, so I want six weeks. You've got to do the deal in six weeks. You know, I can share you the due diligence, uh, but you've got six weeks window. Post that, I'm going to, you know, if this doesn't look like it's happening at that point, then it's not going to happen. Because the reality is what happens is six weeks is, is prolonged anyway. Deals carry on eight weeks, nine weeks. Um, it's, it's almost, a, I find anyway, from a lawyer point of view, having seen many of these, that it's almost something that I think both parties just feel they're trying to keep honest to. And it's, that's the whole point of the term sheet, I guess, in a way, right? Yeah. Um, okay. So funding itself, um, the initial funding that you get uh, how much you're getting, for what valuation, in what form, is it shares or is it convertible loan notes? Is it coming in uh, one go or multiple tranches? Um, you know, the point about multiple tranches is in, in tech businesses generally that doesn't happen. I think you guys will probably get your funding in in one go. If you switch to life sciences, uh, biotech businesses, where the burn rate is really high and the money required sometimes is much higher. So those kind of investments we look at, there's definitely milestones. Milestones are very important in that trajectory. I have, having said that, though, seen a few in, the, in tech space as well, right? So it's not impossible, so it's important to discuss that. Um, so funding, um, I guess for you, you, you all need to at some point think about exactly how much you think you need to raise. You know, the more you raise, unless it's a convertible loan note structure today, the more you raise, the more dilution you're going to suffer, right? So that's just something for you each to get comfortable with. And the valuation plays a, a part in that, as we discussed earlier. Um, how you land on the exact valuation, I think you're going to have to do a lot of talking to people in the industry. Um, you know, looking at other businesses that are similar to yours, that may have raised money and see where they've ended up on valuation. The general sort of industry view at the moment is that valuations are too high, um, rightly or wrongly. That's what certainly in the US has been like that for the last eight, nine months is, is, the, is the view. And that um, the positive spin on that, I think, is that over the last six months, people are saying that valuations have started to correct themselves. And then the further positive spin, I guess, is that valuations in Europe tend to be al almost invariably about a third less than for a similar business in the US. Um, I say further positive because you're in Europe and therefore that should attract you know, um, investors to look at you more. And that's what funds that we're looking at sometimes helping set up. Um, one of the propositions that they make to their future LPs is that actually we're gonna focus on Europe because there's a number of arbitrage to play here. One is the valuation uh, arbitrage, yeah. 
So valuation really important for you. What kind of, how much do you take very important because that goes to the, what I discussed earlier about being realistic, about being uh, coming across as compelling to the investor. That comes down to how much you're going to raise it because the reasons for that are this, 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 this. So you've got to do the basic homework to work out why you're asking for a million bucks. It's because this, why not half a million? Um, and sometimes, very rarely, you, you know, you're too cautious and you, you probably should go for more. And the investor is saying, well, you know, I'd invest if you get one, one and a half million in because I think you're going to need this because this kind of business I've seen in the past burn money like this. Uh, whereas you're only asking for half a million, so how are you rationalizing how you can get there, get there with that limited resource? Uh, it's not to say that you can't have these debates, by the way. You can come up with your number, be sensible about it, but expect a debate about this. Um, the shares or convertible loan notes, we've come on to why convertible loan notes may be, but, but typically you know what that means. You know, Convertibles are, are things where one of the upsides in convertibles is you don't have that huge valuation blocker up front. You, know, you don't need to discuss valuation uh, because it can be parked for later round when you have that valuation debate. When the business is more proven, more metrics are around to determine what that valuation should be. Okay. Milestones, if you do take money on a tranched basis, milestones are absolutely critical. You need to make sure you and the investor both understand exactly what that milestone should be, how it's phrased in the document. It's got to be absolutely measurable. If it's not measurable, you're going to end up in a, in a, in a bit of a, a quandary down the track. Um, could be either way. You, know, you feel it's, it's achieved early, they dispute it. Um, or, or not. Uh, it, it may be it's all fine, but actually you want to avoid that kind of risk. That's the whole point of making sure that these are specific and measurable and, and relevant you know, in the end. Um, and then you may just look at anybody contributing assets. At the early stage, you know, um, you know, you've got to look at yourselves as well. If there are people owed monies, um, you know, the, the messy part, if I can call it quote unquote, that I've seen around working with startups, with startup boot camp, et cetera, is, um, there's a lot of history around where the equity should be, right, which was discussed informally, never formally documented, and bringing that all up to date. Ideally, before you close the round with the investors, you know, with the work that we're doing with you guys now is, is probably the right time to make sure everything is really just, you know, squared away, that there are no loose ends by the time you approach the demo day and the investors. So making sure the business has all the IP that it's meant to have, there's no potential founder who thinks, who created the IP, who hasn't formally signed something saying I've, I've transferred the IP. Um, even something simple as a domain name bought by a founder in the name of the founder, you should think about making sure that it, it's somehow assigned across to the company, really. These can be done later in the worst case, uh, but sometimes if you end up in a dispute with a founder that's concerned, you know, then you may end up in a bit more of a difficult position, right? So do it when it's all, you know, everything is at the start. Um, and then Enzo, we're working on something much more different on how to slice the pie, as it were. But um, that's definitely unique. Okay, shares, just a very quick run through on shares. I mean, for you guys, it'll be ordinary shares, I would think. You can have different classes of shares under English law, and uh, the rights that you attach to each class of share will vary as a result. The only reason you create a different class of shares is to give it a different right. And the most obvious one is one class of shares may have uh, full economic rights and votes, but another class may have the same economic rights but no votes, right? So one is voting, one is non-voting. You all know this, right? Um, preference shares can be used in certain scenarios as well. I've seen people call them Series A shares, Seed Series A shares, all sorts of names, but it doesn't matter what you call them. Um, the main point is that the right that you attach to the shares, what do they look like? And from your point of view, you want to you want to understand that so that you know this is the commercials, right? You can you can have preferred shares, which although have 10% of the business, you know, perfectly feasible to craft set of articles of association which allow those 10% of the shares in the business to actually have a share of the profits which are 50%, right? So all these things can be done. So just be aware of that. And from an investor point of view, when you bring them on early, I think most, most seed investors <coughs> won't expect preferred rights. What they typically expect is a 1x downside protection. And that's a straightforward, you know, if um, there's an exit, and at the point of the exit, the sale proceeds that come out of that exit is enough uh, and more to pay me back my initial investment, then it's, everything is fine. You all share in the pot on a pro rata basis. Parata meaning 
based on your percentage of shares that you hold in the business. But the 1x downside protection happens if on an exit there isn't enough to pay my initial investment back, then the, the draft wording will kick in to allow whatever's left on the table to be paid, to be used to pay the investors back first. So if you think about that, it just means that you won't get anything because the business is done so poorly that if you took in a million pounds today from an investor, five years later, you were in a bad situation where you had to get rid of the whole thing and it was less than a million pounds, half a million. Well, in that scenario, with the 1x downside protection crafted into the documents, the investor will take the half a million. They'll come out first. So people will talk about the liquidation waterfall, the share sale waterfall, the, the preference rights, the uh, liquid, lic pref, liquidation preference. This is all talking about the order of priority of payout on the uh, sale in the future. Okay, um, you can get very technical about this, but these are the sort of the high levels. Um, participating shares are sometimes where people say, um, you know, I, I rank first to get my money out, what I put in, then you guys and I together share in the pot again. So they're taking their money out and then they're sharing pro rata. Now that's a participating right, and again, I wouldn't expect that at seed level. Okay, in the U.S., these things are much more complex, and the investors always get their money out first. And even amongst the investors, the last investor in will get their money out first, and then the next last one, previous one, gets their money out first. So if you think about the amount of money you had to play with in a in a deal, you know you can imagine the pot is getting smaller as people are taking their money out, money out, money out. And, and then you're sharing the pot again at the end. So that's a pure you know, priority payout, participating uh, preference right. If your business does really well, Series C, D, kind of plus, you cross the Atlantic, or, you know, or if you switch horses and do life sciences, I mean, those kind of rights will kick in, but not so much in, in right now for you guys. I would, I would expect that to be a 1x downside only. Um, any questions on that, by the way? No, good. Convertible loan notes. So we talked about it earlier. Why might you use convertible loan notes? Has anyone been thinking about preferring, or they think they might prefer taking convertibles? You at the back? Yep. Yes. Why, why? I've done it in the past. Okay. And they're just really easy to get done. No discussion of valuation. It's just take money, put it in the bank account, spend it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. Right, right, right. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you've done convertibles before? Yeah. Okay. You said, you, you, you said it was easy to do. No negotiations is what you're implying? It was a friend and family round for us, so it's easier, but we use the safe convertible. Well. You use the safe? Okay. Okay. Did you use the safe as well? No, no I, I didn't find out about them until we did. We already did a couple of right. so. Okay. Okay. Um, so. Life in the startup world, I've discovered, is about keeping things as simple as possible from a founder point of view. Um, just a word of warning, and I give this to every client, and I don't mean to say that I don't try and keep it simple, but you have to just realize when you keep it too simple sometimes, you'll miss some bigger, bigger issues for yourself, okay? Just be aware of that. Um, convertible loan notes can be as negotiated as, you know, as anything else in the world, okay? It doesn't, just taking convertible doesn't mean it's easy, doesn't mean it's, it's not going to be discussed. Um, in any way, because they can come in all complexities as well. Um, so the most um, typical convertible loan notes, and now we're in an age in the last sort of, I would say in the UK, eight, nine months, these have been stripped back to their bare bones, yeah? So the safe you're talking about was a precursor, I guess, stripping the convertible to the bare bones. And from the point of view of uh, a founder, that's great, because you're not having to give much away in terms of uh, warranties, in terms of control about the business. Um, whereas if you look at a standard convertible put in place by a more sophisticated investor, not an individual, you know, angel, etc., um, the, the model is that you will have the rights to convert, which are split into two directions, either mandatory rights where they have no choice as an investor, it just automatically converts. You preset the basis on which they convert the conversion price which is kind of done in the safe as well, but, but you do the same thing, but you say it's mandatory on a qualifying financing round, and qualifying financing is what you then agree is, is the type of round that you would like to do next. You know, the size of that round is a certain type. It's about, it's about investors, so have the word investor in there, have the size that you want in there, half a million at least, et cetera, right? And then there's a set which is an optional discretionary right to convert, which investors like to have. The safe doesn't have that so much. Here, you would be more about, um, 
a non-qualifying financing round because it falls below the threshold that you are targeting, but you may do so because realistically all things are possible in the life of a startup. So in that circumstance, the conversion price may be the same, but the investor gets to choose whether to convert or not. And if they don't convert and you never do a financing round, what's the outcome? Well, there's a long stop repayment date. And at that point, they could require that repayment or they could choose to convert at that point as well at a preset rate, maybe. If there's no qualifying financing round, you need to determine what, how that trigger is for the conversion price, but you could do a pre-money valuation or something like this. So that, that's how it gets. And then you get into warranties that you have to give away. But typically, the, the sort of the upsides are it's quicker to do because there's no valuation debate that blocks anything. Um, secondly, from a founder point of view, actually, you don't have huge long lists of veto matters. If you take money from an investor, you know that they may not take a controlling stake, which is the world of PEs. At the world of VC level, you don't do that. But they will care about those high-level issues, which are not meant to be day-to-day -day issues, uh, which they want to have a say over, which they want to have a veto right over. So as a shareholder, not as a board director, because typically investors don't control the board at the outset, because there's more founders, and founders should retain the right to control the board, uh, to appoint the majority, if you like. And so the director of the investors is just one amongst a group. He can't swing the board decisions. Um, these veto matters they care about in shareholders agreements, you will see shareholder investor majority consent requirements and sometimes they're crafted into an investor director consent as well, another limb. Um, in loan notes, typically that's really not there. Um, you may have event or default provisions where you wound up, you, you have to pay them back first. Investors come first in the ranking on a priority payout, right? Always loan note holders come before the shareholders. So that's something else that they like sometimes, okay? Yeah. Oh, sorry, the SAFE is, I um, um, can't remember exactly what the acronym stands for, um, but it's the Y Combinator's version of a very short form uh, convertible. Um, we've actually interestingly used one about two years ago for a South African business that I brought into the UK because they wanted to use that. They had an advisor who was US. Um, came across that that first time then, and it's, it's basically about four or five pages. Um, we converted that into a UK law document in certain places. Um, it works. Um, the big issue, I'd say, is the SAFE is not an EISable instrument. So SEIS, EIS Investments in the UK will not go for the SAFE. However, it's not to say you can't take something like the SAFE and make it into a document that could qualify for that purpose. Okay? The true challenge you'll have, actually, I think, is con convincing people to put their money in on those terms because yeah, they are pretty bare bone terms. So unless it's friends and family that you have or people that really support you and like you and are good friends, you know, then you can do those very quickly. Okay. And there is no way that we have the power on deciding to convert or not. So There's no always the, the shareholder, the person who gives the money who has the power to decide to convert or not. Um, so the question is about conversion rights. Um, so the investor um, typically will be forced to convert, automatically convert into shares at the agreed discount price typically um, at the point a qualifying financing round is done. Whether you split into a qualifying financing and non-qualifying financing or not is up to you. You could just say the next fundraising, whatever that is, where you issue shares, as soon as you take new money and issue shares, that's a fundraising say, at that point you convert. And the price that is used. The no, when they convert, you don't need to reimburse. You don't have no, to repay. If we decide, we cannot decide. So, pre, so typical. So, so the loan notes. Um, so all things can be agreed, but um, the usual loan notes will have rights of prepayment, ideally, in favour of the company, because if you do really well, you can just prepay. Um, investors always want a long stop date for repayment. If they want to be repaid, they'll say on this date it'll be repaid or I can choose to convert at that point maybe. Um, but you will then say, when do I convert? Well, it's a fundraising event. Mm -hmm. Is there a fundraising event of a certain size or not? You need to decide that with the investor. Um, but do they want to have the choice to convert at any point in time? You can give them that if they want it to. Um, I think it's really a give and take. In the end, you need to decide what the right terms are. So I guess what the picture I'm painting here is the convertible loan notes that can come in very many different shapes and sizes. Okay? And whether it's automatic conversion, which investors have no say over, uh, whether it's a, a, a discretionary conversion right, which they like to have, um, most typical loan notes, I would say, have both. And yeah.
it's no, it's absolutely. So it's it's no, it's it's either the investor if you've given them a discretionary right, or it's the actual um, um, outcome that you pre-agreed happening. Yeah. So the fun fundraising of the of the right size, say. Okay. Um, so convertible loan notes, um, usually a discount price. Okay, could be as much as twenty five percent of the round that's you know going to happen, but it could be less. There are sometimes conversion rates like the safes, where you get a mix of you know favoring the investor. You'll say they get you know whichever conversion price favors them the most, calculated by reference to either a capped valuation, you know pre money valuation you agree at four or five million, or a twenty percent discount. You apply the two formulas and you say, does he get more shares out of one or the other? And they, you use that. Um, usually not secured at this point in time. Definitely not secured. Um, if they're asking for security. Um, either you've got some amazing assets that they really think is valuable to have security over, or maybe they're just a little bit unsophisticated and think all loans are secured. But, but really, at this point, shouldn't be secured, I would say. Um, EIS we talked about. There are ways of making, I think, convertibles into EIS or bull shares. Um, you know, uh, in the UK, you've got EFAST now, which is a, um, a group of group of um, group called Entrepreneur Affairs, who's a client of mine. They they use one of their startups use this very bare bones document. Um, they got EIS relief on that, I think, but it's on a case by case basis, as you know. Um, value protection. So, does um, from an investor point of view, these are the sort of ways in which I guess they would look at life and say, I feel more protected. Um, Valuation we talked about, yeah. The lower the valuation they're coming at, you know, the more of the business they get. It's kind of protecting their value. Restrictive covenants. Do we know what that what that means? No. Um, so um, non competes. So founders agreeing that they won't compete with the business uh, during the life of uh, their involvement with the business, and usually for a period thereafter. That period could be, you know, say six months, twelve months. Um, Non-solicitation of suppliers, key suppliers, key customers, key employees. Yeah, those are the sort of the the covenants that we talk about. Uh, lever provisions. Uh, we'll go into some of these in more detail, but um, uh, we'll come onto those. Anti-dilution, return coming out first. We talked about already. Warranties about the business, so they get some comfort. Um, warranties serve two purposes typically for an investor. Yeah, um, it's it's to make sure, a that they're getting the full information, because if you warrant something in your document that the company owns the whole of the IP that it's meant to own, then if in the period of time that they're entitled to rely on that warranty, typically one year in the case of these, where you're at the stage of your your business, in that one year period it transpires that actually the business doesn't own all the IP and there's a value erosion because of that lack of ownership. They could bring a claim against you as warrantors, and the founders are typically always the warrantors as well as the company. And they can bring a claim against the company and the founders for that. Um, and and that liability that you face is is agreed in the documents as the you know in the case of the company typically is the full amount of the investment. So they can recover the full amount of the investment they made against the company or against you guys. You know, usually some level of your salary at the year. Yeah, but it's meant to keep you honest. The warranties. And ensure the second part of it is um, to bring disclosure out so that the investor gets to know about the business as, mu as much as possible. So warranties give them protection because they can bring claims in the future, not something that they really want to do. But the other point really, which is really what they're after, I would say, is um, flush out disclosures. Yeah, Because you get the opportunity at the point you do the deal to put together a so-called disclosure letter, which talks to the warranties. So you could say on the one hand, the company owns all the IP, at the same time, you can protect yourself by being, by by disclosing the fact that actually there is a domain name that's owned by one of the founders. We haven't yet got round to organising the transfer of that, but that's intended, and we'll do that. Investor now knows about it, can take a view on it, and do the deal or not, or stall the deal and say make that transfer happen now as part of completion, or just say actually it's okay, that's fine, acknowledged, noted. So going forward, they can't bring a claim against that because they knew about it, right? So that's the process that's worked into the whole disclosure warranty disclosure process. And it's good for you to know this because if your business ever gets bigger and bigger, as, as we hope it does, you're going to end up in exit scenarios where you do trade sales to either or financial sales. When you do that, warranties, limitations on liability around the warranties, the disclosure process, 
absolutely critical. Any M&A transaction, this is where most money goes into, okay? The due diligence done by lawyers is all about those businesses and the warranties that you get out of that, the lawyers advising the buyer will always be around what kind of warranties they should be seeking. So this, this is a big part of the future of any growing business, I would say. Um, here we try and give the fundamental warranties, right? Limited set of warranties. Preemption rights, we talked about, or I think we will talk about later, right of first refusal, okay. Right, anti-dilution provisions should not be seen by you guys at this stage, um, but do people know what that is? I mean, you may know through the, um, um, SPC used to have this provision, but I think they've, we've, you know, we've since realized that there's actually no point in that. So do you know what anti-dilution means? Yeah, no, sorry, I think you're putting your hand up to answer. Um, that's okay. So anti-dilution is where maybe the later rounds, Series A plus rounds, you may see this. Certainly not something an EIS, SEIs investor will ask for because that prejudices, prejudices their tax relief claim, okay? Because it's a preference that they're getting on their shares. But in essence, it means that um, if an investor is uh, unsure about your valuation, you're asking for a 10 million valuation and they think it's five, say, one of the ways in which they might get a bit more comfortable is to say, okay, I'll come in at 10 this time, right? Is my million pounds for 10 million uh, valuation? I get one tenth of the business, say. Uh, this is post money, but let's say I get one tenth of the business on that basis. If you do another fundraising later, and at that point, the valuation is dropped, okay? So it's a down round from 10 to, say, eight, right? At that point, this, trig this triggers, and this triggers in, um, favor of that earlier investor. And this provision then gives them some surplus bonus shares to make up the difference if they had come in at eight as opposed to 10. In essence, that's what it's trying to do. It's equalizing them so that looking backwards, you treat them as if they came in at eight, yeah? That's the main sort of principle behind it. Um, there are sort of whistles and bells around it. The formula you use can be a full ratchet, which is where they get pound for pound or weighted average, narrow, wide, take account of options, not options. But that's the detail. But, but in essence, that's what it's trying to do. Um, we talked about this already, really, that um, people on the waterfall, who comes out first? Sorry, yeah, was that a question? Or? Uh, one question about the anti dilution. Sure. Uh, is it coming uh, like only for the down rounds or for the up rounds as well? So we are no. talking about this clause only for the down rounds. Down rounds, correct. Yeah. Only. Only for the down rounds. And if people ask for anti-dilution, um, the argument investors typically give um, is, you know, um, you're telling me the valuation is 10 today. You're telling me you're going to grow the business. You're totally confident. I'm not so sure. I want to give you the money. I like you. I'm going to give you the money today on the 10. But if you mess up, because you control the business, you can grow the business, you know, because you're in control. But if you mess up and the valuation drops, then I want to be made good again, back up to the 10. That's, that's the argument they use. If you're doing well, then clearly there's no problem. But just remember though, if you did an up round and then did a further down round, this may still get triggered, okay? Just because you did a next up round doesn't take away this right, unless this, this right is capped in some way in time, okay? And you can have this triggered multiple times if you just do further multiple down rounds, okay? Um, yeah, so, how are money coming, how, how are monies uh, distributed on a sale? So you can get a, in, in, in the waterfall sort of scenario, which is embedded in the articles of association of a UK company, you can have a liquidation winding up. Business is really bad, you're just gonna close it all down, okay? That's the bit that SEIS, EIS relief really cares about, okay? The other is then, a, typically you'd, you'd put in some specific provision about a share sale. If you sold the shares of your company, an exit of a share sale, how is it applied? And usually it may just refer back to the liquidation waterfall. And then an asset sale, if you sold the business assets, there's two ways of selling your business, right? Sell the shares or sell the assets. If you sell pretty much all your assets, that's also a sale. You've just left a shell company. The company is the seller at that point, receives the proceeds. The company then agrees under its articles to distribute the money according to the waterfall that you've pre-agreed. So the same principles can apply, yeah, in that circumstance. And whether you do a share sale or an asset sale, we're digressing slightly, but, it, but it's all about tax in the end for the buyers. But in your scenarios here, you're just saying, how is the money being shared? And really it comes down to share rights. What do you pre-agree? And you want it to be simple, hopefully it's pro rata, yeah? 
maybe the one X downside protection, but that's it. The complications sometimes come in, and you need lawyers really for this to and um, check this because SEIS, EIS sometimes means that people well means that people can't have a preference. People who are looking for this relief can't have a preference, and but they may still want the one X downside protection. So the way that liquidation waterfall is crafted has to be done right to allow them that protection, but not allow them to prejudice their tax claims. And I've seen various many ways people draft this. Um, and if you're not careful, some of them work for the SEI's point of view, but may not work so well for you on a waterfall payout. Others are, you know, you can do them the right way, basically, is what I'm saying. Um, control issues, we talked about this earlier when we talked about convertible loan notes or not. Um, so very high level sort of uh, material issues, investors definitely want to have a veto right over. So there's no point fighting that in my view. The fight actually is about the list of those issues, the numbers of those things that they want to have a veto right over. Yeah. Uh, but really, um, it's things like you know, declaring dividends, materially changing the type of your business that you have. Uh, it could get down into the levels of you know, issuing um, um, new options. You carve out pre-agreed option pool, but new options, um, the shares, new shares being issued doing an exit, starting a litigation, employing somebody paid more than 50,000 pounds a year, changing the terms of an employment or somebody paid more than 50,000 pounds. Those are the kind of things that people look for. But the principle really is, do, you know, this is not meant to give the investors a means to have day-to-day -day control on the business. And that's not what they want, but it's, it should be hopefully a sensible list. Um, and then on that list, if you have one investor, in the case of say SPC, is that one investor's consent that you need? But if you think of a pool of investors who come in, whoever that pool is, then typically you'll make that consent subject to a threshold, a majority. You know, it could be 50%, could be 66 and a third, you know, two thirds, or two thirds, or could be 75%. Obviously, the lower the threshold from your point of view, you might feel the better chances you have to get that consent quickly, uh, etc. Um, and sometimes you get two or three big investors the lead investors, and then you might describe that as a you know, majority of the lead investor consent, and the minority investors don't really have a say, say. But you know, often you just look at the numbers and you just know that there's a few people who really will swing the vote and others won't. Um, board, they'll definitely want sophisticated investors, maybe not angels, will definitely want to have a board seat. Um, I said earlier, sometimes the investor director can give consent on behalf of the investors you know, for the veto rights. Sometimes it's a useful thing to have from your point of view is, you know, if you can say that the investor majority um, or the lead investor consent is required for these veto matters, well, that's as a shareholder, but if they've appointed a director, you could just say if the director from the investor gives the consent, it's deemed to be the same consent. Just practically speeds things up. Um, okay. Information rights, you know, be prepared to obviously share information. You know, the more open you are, the better. Um, the only thing at your point is you probably don't want to be delivering audited accounts because that costs you money to go and get audited accounts. You're a small business, you can get exemption for that. Uh, and most investors, in my experience, have been very you know, easy about giving it you know, unaudited accounts. But it's typically management accounts, maybe it's quarterly, um, annual accounts. Um, yeah, and then part of that package will be some sort of cash flow statements, balance sheets, etc. The usual sort of, you know, batch of information that you want to give. Um, there are accountancy firms, I think, who do s package some of this stuff up for startups as well. I've been told about recently by another startup. Um, sorry, did you have your hand up for a question? Yeah. Uh, I know that everything is negotiable, but hmm. in the real life, how much you can really negotiate from the control issues? I mean, an investor is coming in and says that this is my term sheet and this is what I want. Do you have actually any power to push um, or change something? Or yeah, you do. I mean, you do. I mean, that's, that's when either you do it yourself, most startups do, um, or you come to someone like us and we help you go through that term sheet and say, hey, I think this is over the top. Just change it this way. Change this this way. Take out a few of these. Yeah, you, you do. It's not, a, it's not like they're going to walk away because you, you marked up their term sheet. I mean, if that's the case, that's a very odd investor in my experience. <laughs> Sure. We don't support to pay. Uh, sure. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we are alone on the 
the yeah. part of the table and the other part of the table is the investor with yeah. the money and the lawyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what can you do in this situation? Well, I mean, this is a story of life, right? <laughs> 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 there's a, always a big guy and a, there's a David and a Goliath. Um, I guess your job is to treat yourself like a Goliath, if you like. Oh, actually, David wins, right? So that's a bad, a bad analogy. But, but really, don't, you know, I think this is the point here to give you the, the sort of the high level view. Um, you know, if I, I speak to many startups, but I guess the, the key points I make is um, if you're asking for something because you're, you're sensible about it, you've thought about it, and you're asking for something that makes sense to you as a business, then I think should you should make that case. Um, and it's an investor who rejects that out of hand is probably not the right investor for you. Um, most investors will be sensible. You know, you want the right investor, by the way. It's very important for you, just as much as it is for the investor, that you pick the right investor. The wrong investor, time and time again, has been shown to you know, kill value of. And uh, you know, many founders who've had that experience will tell you that, I'm sure. So the, the investors I know are genuinely nice people. And if they like the business, they're aware that it could be a very competitive scenario for them. And as part of that thinking, they're trying to make sure that something like a list of control matters is not going to be the, the reason why they lose a deal, right? So when they approach you, they'll try and approach you sensibly with a, with a hopefully a, a sensible document. I'm, a, you know, I'm sure there'll be some who'll just throw their standard documents at you because their lawyers churn them out at speed. Um, but don't take it, you know, as being uh, a fait accompli, you know, this is done and I don't have any chance to negotiate. In fact, that's probably the mindset you should never have. Yeah. And if you can't afford lawyers, come to speak to people like us. We'll, we'll say, I've done deals with startups where we say, actually, we'll look at this for you now. It may or may not come to anything, but, you know, we'll pre-agree a set of terms with you and we'll help you negotiate. <coughs> usually takes a month or two to get term sheets in and compare term sheets. If you're in a good position, you'll get different term sheets over time. <coughs> and part of the challenge is making sure, one of the biggest issues you'll have is if you signed a term sheet because you're so desperate for the money, didn't look at anything, um, then you tell us, get instructed us, get us a draft, then you want cheap fees. At that point, actually, it could be really difficult for us because you've pre-agreed things. And then when you try and negotiate out of it, because I'm now explaining to you the things that the other people have drafted it, the other law firms drafted in the documents, you may feel actually, no, that's, that's too much. I can't give them that. Or you know, that, that provision was not something I, I had in mind. Unfortunately, because you've signed a term sheet, it's the principle that matters, right? And you try and stick to the principle as much as you can. Yes, I've done deals of plenty where not every single part of that term sheet is in the final documents. Every lawyer's done that. And there's always a bit of give and take, actually. You know, the other side will move a little bit on one part of the term sheet, will move a little bit on one part. Of the, I've acted for investors doing that. I've acted for startups doing that. I, I think it really it's about a, you should approach this as a collaboration and not as a, you know, a tension kind of where you, you feel like it's us and them. Um, and don't talk to the lawyer at that point. Talk to the client. You know, talk, to the, talk to the investor because you have to convince them. Yeah? And typically, they don't, at term sheet stage, they may not even look at the long list. It might just be just to give it to you because they don't want to negotiate against themselves, right? Typically, you don't want to negotiate against it. Nobody does. And that's why the world of law is sometimes more complex than it needs to be, because people are approaching it from extremes rather than. So I, I think the industry, though, is changing. I think more people are from the middle rather than from the out, outliers. But I definitely don't feel the first time you see a term sheet, you've got to accept everything. Yeah. Covenants we talked about already. I won't spend ages on this. Um, but it's really important, clearly, from an investor point of view, that you say that you'll work for the best interests of the company. You'll dedicate your time to try and grow the business, and you won't grow the business elsewhere through another company. Um, that you will not compete. That will, you will not, if you left the business in six months' time, uh, for the next six months, 12 months, you at least agree that you will not poach people, poach customers, etc. So this is really what it's trying to do. There will be a set of covenants like this in the service agreement, and service agreement non-compete is typically about six months. Not that much longer. By law, it can't be too long. But it can be up to 12 months, maybe even 18 months in shareholders' agreements. Uh, vesting, just very quickly on this, I think this is important because you, you may well be seeing this already um, at the first seed round. Um, so there's two parts of this. Um, you've probably heard of good, bad lever. Yeah? Put your hands up if you haven't. <laughs> right, you haven't heard about good, bad lever. You guys haven't. OK. Um, so investors will put their money in and then say, you need to show me that you're earning the value of your shares over the next three years, four years, 
two years, typically not more than four years, say. If you're agreeing something more than four years, you're slightly on the outlier, unfortunately. So the shorter the period, the better for you. Um, it is imposed typically on the founders. Um, you may impose it on key employees. Well, certainly option pools, you might impose that on them as well. But on the founders, you'll get a, a vesting period. So take, for example, now here, it's a three-year vesting. Um, you could do in the middle there, you see a straight line. You could do a cliff, stepped monthly, quarterly. There's various ways of doing the vesting. But essentially, over that three-year period, as you start you know, going through that period, you're, you're accruing value into your shares, right? And from a tax point of view, you have your shares today. They're, they're voting their full economic rights. Um, if there's an exit tomorrow, you know, all your shares are still fine. But if you leave tomorrow during that period, before an exit, at that point, everything crystallizes. And then you get to say, OK, what's the two things you check? One is, what was the basis on which you left? And you say, are you a good or a bad lever? Things get complicated when you throw in intermediate levers and other things. But, but essentially, good or bad lever, that will dictate the outcome on price. Yeah? If you're a bad lever, you're not rewarded typically. right? And a bad lever, therefore, is someone who was summarily dismissed. Because under the terms of your contract, if you do some really bad things, gross misconduct, fraudulent activities, and so on, the other founders won't want you around, nor will the investors. So you get kicked out with no notice, because service agreements typically say that's no notice. right? That's a bad lever. That person's shares will eff effectively then lose complete value. right? And they, in technical terms, we turn them into these non-valuable shares, yeah, deferred shares. And then the articles will allow the board to just buy back all those shares for like a pound or a penny or something. Okay, That's a bad lever. A, a good lever will get value for their shares. And you may or may not allow them to keep the shares, have votes attaching to them, uh, and keep everything going forward. They can participate in the value going forward. Um, or you may say, we'll have the right to buy it all back, but we'll give you fair value. So today's market value will pay you that. So at least they're getting some money out. Okay? Um, but on a good lever, the point here is you've got a vesting profile. You then say, what was the time when you left? And if it was one third of the three year period and it was a straight line model, then they would have locked in one third of their shares for value. The other two thirds haven't been vested. So they're unvested. Unvested shares then completely go into the deferred class. Same treatment, no value. The, deferred, the, the vested shares, you will be able to get some value out for. Okay? Sort of roughly understand what I'm talking about here? Can get more tricky, but yeah, go for it, Enzo. So, if you are a bad lever mm. and you already have vested shares, uh, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You're a bad lever. Everything is gone. Yeah. Because you, you've been really fraudulent. So, the difficult part comes in. There are shades of gray in everything, OK? I'm trying to give you high levels here. But um, the complication comes in when you, the negotiation sometimes is around resignations. Um, if someone resigns because a founder wants to leave and has another opportunity, is that founder to be treated as a bad lever if it's during that vesting period? Or should it be a good lever, provided it's not you know, something really bad? And that's, that's a challenge. There's no correct answer. The simple model would be to just call it bad lever because they've resigned, they've chosen to leave. They've, you're not going to leave unless you've got something better to do. So you know the outcome on this. You're balancing it against another potential opportunity. So you'll take that on. Well, that means you've, in your head you've done the math and you've decided this is not good enough for you. This is a better outcome for you. Now, of course, the shades of gray, right? So you know, um, someone who basically resigns because actually they feel really badly treated by the business. So under English employment law, you've got things like constructive dismissal, unfair dismissal. Um, constructive dismissal, you, know, you can resign and bring a claim against the company for constructive dismissal. You effectively treated me so badly, you were trying to force me out, so I resigned. I brought a claim. The claim was validated by the employment tribunal. I was correct. Well, that shouldn't be a bad lever. Right? So you have these carve outs here and there. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, any more questions? Did you have one, Enzo, or are you okay? Yeah, I was wondering the way to understand the treatment of the deferred shares when this happens. So there are, if you go away immediately, or as you explained before, it's just a penny and 
process after that? Deferred shares? Yeah, the, the articles will allow the deferred shares to be bought back at any point of time just before a penny, right? So by that's anyone, just the company would buy it back or anyone. Yeah, you could put a priority in there if you wanted to um, or the board could allocate it to somebody. Else. Deferred shares are not worth having, basically. You could just let them out there, leave them out there if you wanted to. Yeah, yeah. But if these shares disappear, yeah. uh, then the rest of the, of the people, that they get more percentage of the company? Yeah. Yeah, it's a pro rata impact on everybody. Yeah, which is which is what the point of this is. You know, um, you're taking value away from the wrong people, I guess, right? And then everybody else bumps up on a pro rata basis. The one thing I'd say is when you have the um, point about what happens to a good lever, um, it's always worth considering whether the last point there, if you let them, if they have vested shares, you can either buy them back and you can draft it. So you have the ability to always buy them back within a period of time. You know, it's always a bit mechanical issue, but, but people do do that. But, but, the, but the point is whether you want to let them have voting rights at that juncture. In my view, I think it's better to not have voting rights. What they really care about is economics, right? So if they can share in the growth trajectory, you know, great, let them have that. As founders, you pre-agree that, but you don't want them having votes. It's a bit of a mess, you know, it's, a, it's an old founder, no longer involved in the business. Do they really care about the voting rights anymore? They're not like an investor. Who does? Uh, yeah, I go for it. Um, yeah, I mean, there's no. To be honest with you, th it's all it's all kind of generic wording, which looks at a sensible way of arriving at it. Uh, first. There's also often the issue that let's say somebody's been working for Sweat Equity. Mm. They may have very little personal finance with which to purchase shares. However, they've been working terribly hard. Sure. Um, well, no, if they're the lever, they're not purchasing, right? They're selling. So that's fine. It's the, usually the outcome is on the other side where you want to incentivize an existing founder. So the priority... I'm not talking about the buyback. I'm talking about the, the, the shares, the share options which best and the, the person who then has the option. Right. Um, on options, slightly different. So if you're asking me um, a, a, a valuable employee who's got the right um, to exercise options, um, but they don't have the money to pay for the exercise price, yeah. is that what you're asking? Yeah. Um, so most of you guys should always set up um, an EMI and an unapproved option scheme. You know, you can go around the houses on this, but, but typically that's where you'd end up, I think. And those are two different, uh, can be in the same option um, scheme, but two different types of options. Full-time employees, EMI scheme, very tax efficient. Um, Non-full-time consultants and the like can be given unapproved options. They incentivize them, obviously, but to a less tax efficient degree. Um, in terms of exercise price, um, I mean, the most obvious is, you know, um, you don't exercise. It's up to you to exercise. The um, options can be allowed to be exercised as in they vest. Or my preferred option is, uh, my preferred practice, I guess, is option plans should have some certain trigger dates for exercise rights. And it should be when the vesting period on the options themselves have been fully um, um, seen through or when an exit happens. Immediately before an exit, always accelerates. It's all deemed to be vested. Yeah. And... Of course, the easy scenario, the real scenario, I would say, is in those circumstances, it may be that you might think of a loan and so on, but, but the real scenario is you look for the exit. And on an exit, you can do a cashless exercise. So you are deemed to have exercise immediately before the exit happens. Uh, you're a shareholder, you're a seller of the shares, but you pre-agree through the documents that instead of you uh, receiving, sorry, paying in your exercise price, you pre-agree with the company that there will be a set-off um, against your sale proceeds of that exercise price. So you receive an amount which is netted off at the end of it, yeah? So that's how it usually happens with any M&A transaction or any, any scenario with an exit. Okay? Yeah, go for it, yeah. One question here. Yeah. Uh, all this science about good liver, what means bad liver, good liver, and everything yeah. regarding the vesting and so on, it's part of the shareholder agreement? Uh, yes, it would be. It so would be. With the investment, you 
to yes, it's, 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 it's what an investor would ask for you, right? So it'd be in the articles of association typically. Um, you know, people can put it in the shareholders agreement, but typically it's just been the articles. Um, but this is what um, is documented at the same time. It's part of the term sheet. Um, if investors don't want it, great. You know, um, the question sometimes you have to ask yourself is: that as founders, do you want to impose it on yourselves? You know, because there's three or four of you, you may feel that actually one, you know, one leaves early and uh, they've still got shares. Uh, you, you might not feel comfortable with that. But but usually it's, a, it's an investor requirement, and certainly as you get up the trajectory, it, you know, on your fundraising sizes, this will be a, a requirement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your current documents with SBC doesn't have this, but tomorrow when you do the seed round, you may get a term sheet which includes the requirement for vesting provisions to be inserted. At that point, you change your articles, change your shareholders agreement. One of the provisions you drop in is this. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm good. Um, when, when you get investment, do these reset? Um, oh, I see. You mean the vesting period? Yeah, look, it's, there's no answer on that that I can give you, really. It's, it's commercials. It's what the new investors decide. Um, typically, you know, you'd hold to the principle and you'd say the vesting continues. Um, or you may change the terms of lever provisions in a way that the time frame is not changed, right? So you may change the categories of good and bad. You may insert a different category of intermediate or whatever. But the time frame still looks back. And the commencement date for the vesting period when you do the calculation is given, you know, you get given the benefit of the time you've spent. I'd expect that typically, right? But unless someone's coming in with 20 million pound check and they're really big, big player and they all want just from the time I'm, that's, you know. But yeah, those, those, those things can be renegotiated though. Just be aware of that, yeah. Okay, any more questions on this? Share transfers, um, we're near the end now, you'll be pleased to know. Um, very normal to have, does anybody know what we talk about when we talk about permitted transfers? Yeah, permitted transfers, very standard. Every shareholder, if they're an individual, are allowed to transfer to their family members, say. Every shareholder who's a corporate is allowed to transfer to a group company. Uh, the proviso is there's a compulsory transfer back requirement if the subsidiary or whatever it might be has cease to be a group company. You can sell group companies off, obviously. If that happens, there's, there's got to be a transfer back to the original transfer rule. Um, same with family members. Wives might get divorced, I guess. I don't know. So these are very standard. The next stage on transfers is then, unless um, it's a permitted transfer, if it's not a permitted transfer, you follow the preemption procedure. Again, very normal to have. Um, it means if you're transferring your shares, um, to a non-permitted transferee of yours, so not a family member, just a, a, a friend down the road, um, you can't do that transfer unless you follow this preemption procedure. And the preemption procedure effectively allows the current shareholders to have first dibs on your shares, yeah? At the price, on the terms you're proposing to transfer. And if they choose to take it up, you have no choice but to make that transfer to the people who say, I want those shares, okay? It's intended to protect and give first rights of refusal, if you like, to the current investor base, current shareholder base, including yourselves. Yeah? Um, a spin on that is investors write a first refusal. Sometimes investors say that I want to be the first group, first person to be able to come in and say yes or no. And then it will go down to the others. So different classes of shares sometimes may say the priority right of allocation is A shareholders first. They can take the whole bunch of shares. And if there's any left, it'll be filtered down on a pro rata basis of the B shares, yeah? So you can see that as well. But, but generally, where you want to be is just preemption on a pro rata basis, okay? Um, then drag and tag rights, um, you know, drag rights are to ensure that on a future exit, um, you can deliver 100% of the business and not be held ransom by a minor shareholder, yeah? And so if you hit the threshold for a drag right, which is say 75%, 90% is statutory, but 75% in your case in the article say, then provided it's you know, a arm's length commercial transaction that you've got on the table with a third party buyer, so it's a true transaction, it's not a sort of trumped up you know, 
um, sailor discount kind of scenario, then you can apply the discount, you can apply the drag rights. And then you'd go through a process, you serve a drag notice. You try not to go through that process, by the way, but you, 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 if you had to, you'd do that. Um, tag rights are to ensure the opposite, that a minority shareholder can exit, achieve liquidity, where 50% of the class of the shares are being sold, or where it might be that, you know, um, a particular type of investor is selling their shares, maybe. Okay. Um, there is a co-sale right I haven't talked about, which sometimes investors want. Um, they want the ability to be able to tag along and sell some of their shares in place of the shares that the founder is looking to sell. Um, having gone through the preemption, founder wants to sell shares, not a permitted transfer transfer at all. Goes through the preemption, some shares still remain that people don't want to buy. They're allowed to sell to the third party now, but before they do so, if there's a co-sale provision in favor of investors, it may be that instead of 100 shares of that founder that are left over that they can now sell, they're actually only able to sell 80, because 20 are investor shares that need to be sold at the same time, if the investor exercises are right. You usually just stop um, founders exiting completely because the investors don't feel comfortable being in a company where there's no founder now. The people that they backed have suddenly disappeared. Yeah, that's sometimes the, the rationale that, you know, that's applied. Um, I think that was it. So we reached the end. Any uh, any last minute questions? Um, I had a question at the beginning when you talk about the valuation and yeah. the dimension of the investment. Um, if you have any experience with harder startups, because the use case is very different from the software uh, part. Um, usually, I heard that uh, investors are not investing in stock and in production. Uh, what do you think about that? What did you see in the real world? Because I, I read a lot about that. And mm. I didn't extract any uh, uh, very Um, it's a good question. Look, I, I, I'm a lawyer. I know, uh, obviously, a little bit about the world of investors and so on. Um, I think, I guess my gut reaction is um, you, you may need to focus on partners for the hardware development side. So the less you want to raise money to go and do that, the better, I think. So usually most of you guys might have a hardware element to what you're trying to do, right? Software and a hardware element. If, you're, if you've got that, I think the hardware part, if you can find a partner who's willing to go through the initial stages of developing the prototype, if you've already got that, great. Um, you know, you do a deal with that manufacturer, you know, so that they will take on the unit cost production as much as possible up front, and you do a revenue share or something on sales in a way that maybe they are preferred in the early stages. Um, I think unless you get that kind of a partnership going, and I think you need to be able to show that to most investors, by the way, I would expect, if I was an investor, I'd, I'd, be, I'd prefer to see that. Um, the conversion of the sale becomes the next issue, I guess, and what you're selling, whether it's a software and a hardware, the pricing of that hardware. If these are really expensive things that, you know, in order to buy your software, someone has to buy this, is it a B2B or B2C play maybe comes into this? But um, if it's a B2C, then I think the pricing is really important. It can't be too expensive. Um, but if you've got a partner who's willing to lay out the production cost, provided you show them something else, I don't know, uh, which might be the money that you know, you're taking on board to develop um, the business overall. So the partner sees that you know, you've got the traction to, once you sign a term sheet, they'll say, fine, will back you up on the production side as you scale, right? That's the kind of tying in deal you might need to do, I think. Um, I that because you mentioned about the business plan, and the mm -hmm. business plan have to uh, show how you uh, sure. spend the money. Yeah. 
Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, I, I think the answer probably depends on the type of hardware, the cost of that hardware. Um, if it's a B2C, the price of that hardware that you're selling out to, um, what profit margins exist on the hardware itself, um, you know. I, I guess, you know, if you're, if you're a t-shirt company, you've got to go and produce t-shirts, but you know if you can do bulk, it's much cheaper. So you try and raise enough money to go and do the bulk print. Um, I don't know if it's the same in hardware. It might be the same. It might not be. But if you can get a partnership with somebody, then you're taking that risk off the table. Um, yes, there's less money for you to share in, but, but actually the investor money then comes into converting the right things, which is a software element, the sales traction, the marketing angle. Um, and then I think they'll see the benefit of the hardware partnership more. But you know, you, you may need a corporate to come in and be an investor, in which case they may have the money to go and expand for you. Um, but the worst case is you do the software part first and the hardware has to wait a little bit because you need growth money to do the hardware and that's later type of investors. Yeah, yeah. okay. Will you be able to share the slides? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it with these guys here. No, you're already there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no problems. Um, any more questions? Um, good. Well, good luck with the uh, efforts until demo day. Um, and then, yeah, any questions, uh, just, just drop us a line. We're, we're around. Happy to have an informal chat. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.